Well, something I'm going to begin doing is bringing a different client plan to you, uh, hopefully every month. And we'll maybe start a series if, if uh, you viewers like that. And so what I'm going to do is I had 11 clients in January. So February, I'll pick my favorite plan from, uh, from January, share it with you guys. And, and, um, and, you know, ultimately just to help you learn. And so in January, I was in uh, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Ohio. Um, I'll have 11, 11 clients. And again, I'll bring my favorite one to you in February. I just picked a random one of the past. This is one that um, I thought was easy to illustrate. This is going back all the way to 2014, 15, somewhere around there. And um, client's name of Justin in Central Michigan. I'll just leave it at that. This is a plan that I actually drew up with Justin and his family. I believe his father was there, maybe a brother. But I drew this up with them showed this to them, discussed, them at, discussed this plan at length at the end of the day, just like you do with all clients. And uh, in the end, I thought it was a good illustration for you. So I'm gonna just go over some of the key points of this plan and why I think it works. And real quick, I just say these red dots and access trails, those are stand locations. Orange areas, uh, bedding. And we'll talk about a couple different bedding areas uh, based on the type of the timber that we're, we're in those locations. For example, a lot of white pine up here and, uh, and then a lot of hardwoods, open out hardwoods down here. Yellow are deer trails. Uh, deer trails used even if you're just creating those 50 to 100 yards out on either side to come together almost like a bow tie at the stand location just to help you further direct deer. Green, of course, food plots. The beige along the food plots, some type of switchgrass edging where whether it's a large area or a large pocket or small six to 10 foot area just used for screening. And then finally, location for a water hole up in the corner here. And, uh, and so those are, that's kind of legend going through here. And we'll talk about, about what this blob is here at the end. In this particular case, you have a house coming right in here. And it's right in the center of that property where it comes in from the north. And it takes a good chunk into the property. Now, I have a few options in here. There's already an, a big old field right here. Some uh, area in the woods here that they can make larger. This was an open valley over here parallel to this road. And, and really, I wanted to establish food plot locations that would match the length of the parcel. And what I mean by that, this is a 65 acre parcel right around there, but I'm looking at this parcel as a length like this. Now, if we put all the food here, we didn't have food on this side, then this side of the land, because it's going to be more, to the, more than a quarter mile wide, I would say it's about 700 yards wide, then this area back here is not supported by food. You're not typically gonna have food on this side and then bring deer all the way across to hit that food in the afternoon every single day. If they're over bedding here, they're probably going off to a neighbor's food source. Easy way to lose them if it's not complemented by food. At the same time, if you put a giant food plot down here in the middle of the cover, now you're pushing those deer off to the neighbor's land. So long, Linear food plots are, are appropriate for this. You can see out here, I have some linear food plots in Minnesota. I have some round food plots, irregular shaped food plots. We have a new one next year. They'll be almost like a triangle. It's about an acre. So it's not that a certain size or a certain shape is what you need. Um, I don't like where you have to have, have an hourglass plot or a boomerang plot, plot or whatever it might be. And you try to just fit that round, head, round peg in a square hole and try to make it work and it doesn't work. And in this case, with a road right here, not a lot of activity on that road, but I wanted to make sure that a food plot just didn't end right here where deer could go on and off and potentially cross that road and you lose them to the other side or, you know, God forbid, a car going by. So you really need to, to shape these food plots so that they match the, uh, in a parallel fashion to the road, so you're not pushing deer across. And then there's a giant bedding area on this side, open timber in this corner. And the deer from here, a lot of times it curl around this swamp. This is a big swamp right here. So you're just getting to the edge of that swamp. And, and then with a big break wall of brush, it's very thick. Deer weren't using that location a lot. Neighbor's house right over here. So a lot of those deer were turning in or back into the heart of the property. And, and that way we weren't losing them. We weren't losing them across the road, we weren't losing them to the neighbors. And that set up a great stand location where imagine the deer out here somewhere in the morning, 
where someone can slip into a stand like that in the morning, wait for the deer to come back to them off that food plot and have a good opportunity at a buck in that location. So this food, if you look at it, it's one linear line of food all the way from the northeast corner across and behind the home into the west. What that allows is the bulk of the doe herd, they don't want to bed too far into the cover. They want to bed as close to the food source as possible. If you have one big single food source, it's hard to have a lot of does and fawns that relate to that where they have to stack up every single day on top of each other. The stress level goes up. Does are fighting for the same food source. Does leave. Bucks stay well outside of all that mess and stress and they don't even live near the property, let alone visit the property in a property like that. So in this linear fashion, these does are allowed to bed close to the food plot all the way around either side of the food plot in some circumstances up here along here so you're trying to take on a long thin property like that trying to put the bulk of the deer herd or bulk of the does bedding close to that food source and stretching them out and when you do that then you can have doe family groups spread throughout the entire property in a linear fashion against the food sources and what does that do that opens up more of the remote locations back by the swamp and along and away from food, it allows for buck bedding, and especially older bucks. So by using that linear food source, you pull deer out of the cover in the form of does and fawns against the food sources, you spread them out in an extremely long length. From that length all the way through to this over here would be my best guess of 900 to 1,000 yards if you looked at that entire linear food plot system where you can bed does and fawns very close to that food source and then that frees up space when you have a long narrow property that's what you have to do unless you put food on one end food on the other and you have alternate access and then you create that inside in the middle for bucks there's more than one ways to skin a cat or design a property in this case so that would be the best where you have that food stretched out over a long linear fashion once you have the food plots once you know your access and you can get around those food plots then you can create those bedding areas in some of these areas, it was a matter of a lot of hinge cuts where you had early succession of growth and autumn olive choked fields where you could open up the autumn olive, make sure the deer can move around within. When you get back in here, big open hardwoods where you had to knock down some of those hardwoods, those big open canopies, especially I don't believe the landowners were in um, really looking for a timber harvest at that time. But going in there and focusing on those low dollar, low value trees that are leaners, forked, non timber harvest species that you can get down, take out of the woods and then open up a lot of canopy, especially to the south across There's all swamp back here. So that allows for a lot of openings from the south to get sunlight in there, flood that. And all of a sudden, when you come to a stand back here or here, even back here, very remote settings because you're waiting for those bucks to come back to you during daylight hours. You're blowing your scent back into the swamp and your neighbor's open hardwoods over this side from these stands. And it gives you that stand assemblage. So once you have the bedding areas, create these travel corridors to set up these various stand locations, meaning that you're looking for multiple ways for those deer to travel in front of you. Then because you have the food, you have an assemblage of stands you've created for morning and afternoon stands. I talk about it often. If you look at a property plan and you can't figure out where morning stands and evening stands are, you need to go back to the drawing board. That's one of the tests of a great whitetail parcel is that you have defined evening stands and morning stands. Evening stands, right back here, in these locations between food close to the house, between bedding close to the house, right up in here where they're accessing out and going to the neighbors, Really good evening stands where you can take advantage of multiple winds. And take advantage of food source movements from deer going to bedding, to food, and between bedding. And then you have these very defined morning stands back here in the corner and all around where you can actually expect some morning movement. And you can even make a case for here. You come off the road get into a stand like that, you're walking through some switchgrass, I think they had a pop-up blind there that would have worked, and taking advantage of that road access, easterly winds, which, you get, which we get on the front side of every major weather front that comes through about once a week on average during the hunting season. 
a little fact on that, you want to have stand locations for every wind because south southwest in this area of Michigan and most of the upper Midwest, all the way over into Pennsylvania, New York, over in the Dakotas, if you look at weather underground and you look at their historical weather data, pull up October, pull up November, and what you'll find is your stable winds are some type of southerly wind, usually south southwest, south southeast. Those are those boring stable winds you get every day. That's about 35% of all winds. That's your stable wind, not northwest. Northerly winds happen when it's getting colder, only colder. So to say that you get northwest winds during the hunting season the most is to say that it's getting colder every single day or every couple days, and that's just not true. You'll find that northerly winds, westerly winds, easterly winds are all about the same, making up those remaining 65% fairly equal. And again, easterly winds on the front side of every front, which gives you the opportunity to hunt east stands um, during those sits um, often throughout the season. Well, we had some technical difficulties in a good way. The screen brightened up, and while we're playing around with the TV, we found this little magical pointer thing <laughs> that I can use too. So instead of using my arrow right there, and I don't know if you noticed, this is a victory arrow. This is what I've been using for hunting. I love these arrows. Um, I really like the Muzzy Trocar HBs uh, for a broadhead, um, but I ruined too many this year, uh, making a lot of mistakes. I shot a couple bucks with a bow. But um, so I ended up with these swackers, which is what Dylan and the guys from Breaking Point use. So I, I ended up with some of these, but um, I really love my Muzzy Trocar HBs. And with everything going on with COVID and the outdoor industry being taken by storm with sales and things running out, I couldn't get a hold of any of the Muzzy Trocar HBs. Um, so you can bet I'll stock up a lot before next season because I, I like those uh, broadheads a lot. Kind of what I've narrowed it down to over the last couple of years, playing with a whole bunch of other ones. In the meantime though, this, uh, this setting right here, I hope that makes sense with that linear food source stretching all the way through the property. That sets up the opportunity for does bedding close to that food source, especially when you get off of that screening around the food plot of uh, switchgrass, which you can see here, six to 10 feet wide on most of these interior food plots, and then some big blocks that help block the neighbors, block the road over on this side, and allow hunters to access around areas of points of interest like the connection to these food plots or around this corner where you need that big block of switchgrass where the deer aren't going to bed in it but they can actually be hidden by it and by your access and it adds uh, something really special to the property that creates the opportunity like i said for bucks back here up here it gives you that uh, assemblage of morning and evening stands and then you can see the access routes coming in from the driveway coming in from road. Road access is incredible. If it's wooded along the road, you don't have poachers. But there's a lot more poachers that people think are out there than actually are. A lot of times those bucks that you're after, you don't see as a three or four year old, not because they're not alive, but because they went to someone else's land that has that 3% parcel in the area that actually is the one of the very few parcels in the area that attracts mature bucks. As a buck ages, he can't stand the stress that he took when he was a fawn, when he was a year and a half old, two and a half year old. I feel like they need a different level of low stress, getting better and better for them, less stress along the way through by the time they get to five, six, seven years old, um, they get to that age of reclusiveness, that they get to that location that keeps them alive, low stress. And by making this lengthy parcel here, again, we've assemblage, assemblage stands where you could get in in the morning, stands for evening opportunity. Deer trails, in this case right up here, this big orange bedding area, had a lot of pine. And then there's a few uh, soft maple and hardwood mixed within. Great getting those on the ground, hinge cutting the appropriate size. So you can offer a visual bar barrier horizontally through this location and offer some regeneration so that deer will actually bed in there instead of a big pile of big old white pines that were field grown, a lot of branches. Um, strip right here where it was very thick cover, opening up that cover back in here too. Um, when it gets choked out by autumn olive, I recommend removing 50% of it, spraying it so it doesn't come back. You have big wide open rooms and trails for deer to go between. Back here, removing high dollar canopy trees, either harvesting those and leaving the junk, hinge cutting the junk, leaving some of the mature standing, or actually pocket cutting and trying to focus on trees that are malformed leaning and don't represent a tree that the logger wants to actually harvest in the future for future boards and dollars per foot. 
the same with up in here too. This was a lot of hardwoods in this location. So really, whether it's focusing on hardwoods, creating bedding area, edge where you're dropping trees to the marsh to allow sunlight to flood into the property, opening up autumn olive areas and field areas so deer can actually move so it's not so choked out, or going up in this area and focusing on those young trees, hardwoods within the conifers, knocking down an occasional conifer so the sunlight hits the ground, but really focusing on those hardwoods. Finally, back in this dry area, this entire area was dry. Typically, if deer want some water, they're not gonna come all the way down to this water in the stream, they're gonna go back up. In a long hunting plot like this, where you have a narrow feature, they already had a water hole there, so pretty easy to continue the use of that so deer are encouraged to use this water. Walk by this stand, that stand, this stand on the way to water, this stand on the way to water. That water becomes a hub with food for a high traction, and you can bet I recommend it a mock scrape at every single stand location in here, and really so that you can shoot to them with a bow. So I hope that makes sense. Um, when you're looking at all of this, it looks like a big mess maybe. I hope the features make sense, the legend makes sense. What I drew out for, and this is the same shot, this is the same screenshot that I gave the clients when I completed the, uh, um, the visit that day. Again, I drew this out with the clients, went over it, but this is how I illustrate that a lot of times first, where I shade this out, and that's that area out of that 64 acres, not including the house, that you devote to all deer all the time. That you could include your food plots, it should include your bedding areas, Stand locations are at the edge of that. Your mock scrapes are in that. Your travel corridors are in that core. What a, lot of, what a lot of people don't realize is that in this entire makeup right here, whether this is a odd figure or it's a square 40 and you're just taking out that inside 25 acres, this is your parcel efficiency. This is the area, the percentage of land of acres that you have devoted out of that parcel, that parcel size. Let's say this parcel is 64 acres, 65. Well, they're gonna have 45 acres dedicated to all deer all the time. You keep your scent blowing out of this area, you keep your sound out of that area, and you keep your sight out of that area. And that's what makes a great property. Now, then when I leave the client and I've given them this and we've taken notes, I encourage my clients to take notes, record, the, the follow-up at the end of the uh, visit where I actually draw the plan with them. It takes about an hour. And then I encourage them to get it on video, record it on their phone, take as many notes as possible. We've sat there for two hours going over 30 questions and going over seven pages of notes because I want to make sure when I leave that the clients have it right. Um, and frankly, when I leave and I go away, then I want that client property to be done right there. That's why a lot of times we take the effort to take those notes, put it, I don't have time when I get back, we're making videos, books, uh, web classes to actually sit down for hours and hash this out, call people, that kind of thing. So then it, it really boils down to once they have the information when I leave, then it's, it's specific questions that helps, helps them a lot. You know, uh, you talked about making this switchgrass um, planting around the food plot, how wide should that be? When should I frost my switch seed again, uh, grass again? And, and a lot of this, you know, I answer 600 ways on YouTube and all these different videos, but it's hard for clients or for anybody if you want information to go and look for that detailed information. What I do encourage you to do is any of these strategies that you see here, hunting strategies, um, let's say you want to talk about hunting nocturnal bucks. Well, just type in how to hunt nocturnal bucks on YouTube and my information, my YouTube videos will come up at the top. Anything that you can find, even just put in white tail habitat solutions, nocturnal box or switchgrass, whatever it might be, my content will come up at the top and you could use that and it's a quick way, a quick reference. In the case here, just like all my clients, I don't know if they did any work. Um, um, you know, I would say 20% of my clients, 15% when I leave, Diane always asks me, do you think they're gonna do the work? And uh, I just don't know on some people. Um, there's probably about 20, even 30% of my clients that do everything that summer, that spring. They do it within a few months. And then there's probably about 40, 50% in between that I don't hear from. And all of a sudden, three years later, hey, we decided to start to do the work. Look at this big 10-point we shot. And look what my daughter shot or my son. 
So pretty cool. And so I know there's a blend of people that actually attack these plans or not, but I can guarantee you this client right here, if they did the work, they'd find success. I have the history to prove that. I hope that I can translate some of this to you and that you can apply it to your own land because that's what it's all about. I want you to find success and I'll keep showing these uh, every month and all the strategy comes with it because I enjoy finding success. Um, I feel like there's a real systematic plan and way that you can do that. And uh, if you follow the examples on this 64 acre property, 65 acre property, maybe you can apply that to your own, find some success in, the, success in this off season and certainly in the hunting season to come this year. Now, as we transition into habitat season, I hope you've had a chance to check out my web class, how to design your web, your whitetail parcel. It's on my website, whitetailhabitatsolutions.com. I have a link in the description and I hope you can find it, check it out and enjoy it this year.